All right, I said it was done yesterday and then I got here and by the time it was all said and done, I still had almost four hours of work I put into the toolbar this morning. Um, for the gauge wheels, basically what I ended up doing, uh, dropped in one hole, which was two inches, which is basically what it needed to go. And they still missed these set screws, but not by much. So basically what I was able to do, there was enough meat in the uh, box tube that rather than making spacers and having to make more parts, I was able to offset the holes. So basically now the bolts are skirting the back web of the box tube. Um, and there's still plenty of meat in between the holes and everything. So for what they're doing, they'll be fine. Um, I think ultimately just looking at the way it was acting running in the ground, the best option um, in the long run, and I'll just have to run it for a season and see how it acts. Um, but I think the best solution long run is going to be to buy and or make, depending on what my options are, uh, depth bands for the coulters and eliminate the uh, gauge wheels altogether and actually let the coulters set the depth of the toolbar. That way you can run with the wings unlocked and let them float on their own or independently of the center section. That way it'll follow ground, ground contour better. That being said, if I do that, probably end up having to make some weight brackets or something to add weight to the wings so that they don't ride out. Um, but I think that's probably gonna be what ultimately happens. But like I say, we'll just have to run it and see how it acts. Um, some of my ground's kind of rolly, so we'll just have to see. Um, and then, so that took me a took me a little bit to do that and some trial and error. Uh, and then went to put the chain on the drive, and that turned into a project on its own. I'm not a hundred percent sure how the heck they even ran it before without the chain falling off, because I got everything set and. The sprocket on the rim was damn near sucked up underneath the pump base to the point where I basically had this sprocket sucked up as far as it could go up against the housing and still have clearance to turn and the chain still ran crooked coming down so I ended up having to make some inch and an eighth spacers to space the sprocket out on the rim which got this sprocket out almost all the way on the pump shaft which works out nice for several reasons first off if you ever got to take it off now you have room to get a puller on it um secondly you don't want if you can at all avoid it to have a have anything running on a shaft right up tight next to a seal because that just leaves a narrow space for shit to collect and since this is a gearbox that does not have a cooling system after a while this thing will warm up and you might as well just figure on it will weep a little bit of oil because that's just what that's that's just what's going to happen um so you get a little oil that wicks out of there and then it's collecting dirt and shit and if it's got if you got a really tight gap closed up there, then all that dirt just collects in there and it wipes the seal out. And next thing you know, the better that you're wiping bearings out and leaking oil and all sorts of stuff. So bigger gap, better for the seal and the bearing to an extent. You don't want to have it clear the hell out here because then you got that much lever action to bend the shaft like it was the first go around. But we should be fine right here because we're not going to beat the crap out of it like, the, like it was at the... I'm guessing it came from a co-op. It almost would have had to have so that's all buttoned up depth is pretty much set i got some measurements that i needed um there's obviously once we get get rolling with it there will probably be odds and ends that need to be changed but for now or for for, for now i am calling the toolbar done 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 so um, with that being said, we can start working on the cart. And the first step in that, um, basically about the only thing I'm going to be able to do today is get the axle designed 
because we're gonna have to get some steel probably end up, probably gonna end up getting some burnouts done um, just to make things nicer and easier to assemble and reduce the machining time um, but to do that or to start laying out stuff we need to start stacking parts up so the first thing I need to do is get the hubs apart get the threads cleaned up get the bolts cleaned up so that we can st set the hubs in the wheels and start stacking everything up and figure out how long we need to make the axle because we know what the wheel spacing needs to be um to straddle four and run centers so it's just a matter of putting parts together and subtracting distances until we get to get to whatever length i need to cut the i-beam which we'll go up and or h-beam sorry and then we'll go up and get that and go from there but hubs first There we go. Whoops. I didn't want the bearing to fall out. Well, I was hoping the bearings were going to be usable. And when I got the first tub apart, I thought we were in pretty good shape. Because the bearings in the first tub were... I mean, they're a little... They got this, like this one here's got one little spot in it. But for the most part, the bearings out of the first one are were very runnable. With a little bit of cleaning. Man, I took the second one apart. Not so much. This must have been the one that was sitting down. This, this spreader that I got this axle off of was like perched kind of cockeyed up on top of a scrap pile and it had one hub kind of part way in the ground. I'm guessing that that was this hub. Um, so we're going to have to do wheel bearings. But luckily I found a one of the seals had a good legible Chicago rawhide number on it. And obviously the bearings and or the cups and cones have good Timken numbers that are legible, so. I'm sorry, Timken. You're scrap. So anyhow, just gotta, and I got as much of the grease out of these hubs as I can, but holy crap, I'll bet these things hold a good chunk of a tube of grease a piece. Because this whole cavity, all this, and even this, this, bump out back here this is all hollow this had to have been a fairly intricate intricate casting because the the grease cavity actually comes up and wraps around and is like like that it's a massive grease cavity is what i'm saying and it ain't fun to dig any of it out of there but you can see there's still grease down and you can't i can't get my fingers up through there very deep and when you spin your fingers around to try to get it out, all you accomplish is smearing the grease around and nothing comes out. So that's just going to have to stay in there. But they're cleaned up for the most part. Just got to chase threads and we can throw them in the hole or throw them in the rims and get some measuring.
all right so this is kind of roughly how it's gonna look um basically in order to get the tank above the pump while the plant or while it's while the toolbars in the ground in work position um needs to be roughly 144 to or not 144 not 144 that'd be 12 foot um needs to be about 44 inches to the bottom of the tank or top of the it would have to be about 40 inches to the top of the frame because the uh tank saddles add about four inches um basically kind of the plan is to get the cart frame high enough that we can run the axle underneath without having to blow a hole in this channel iron um because right now like, like say we laid the the uh h-beam right hard up against here you'd have to come down in here and cut out an h-shaped pattern to shove the beam through and weld it in which eh. um i should say that's not out of the realm of possibility it would make the frame really strong um but right now i have the frame set at 36 and um kind of the, the thought is get the frame to a comfortable height and then make up the rest of the height to get the tank where it needs to be by modifying the tank saddles um so and then the draw bar will be modified in such a way that the uh hitch coming out of here is just going to be straight and then we're going to burge mouse this this channel out so we can heat it and bend it at whatever and it it's going to fall somewhere in here ish to make everything in line while it's in work position um so the frame is probably going to come up just a hair and things are going to change but basically that's why i set this up is now we can uh jockey some stuff around and do some visualizing and some measuring and see what this is actually going to look like um the toolbar has to come down a little bit because when i was running it in the field it was anywhere between about 24 and 27 to the center of the hitch so at a minimum it needs to come down three more inches to be at work depth um so but anyway we'll do some measuring here and see what we can come up with for some sort of plan all right so i tore down my visualization aid um we got everything we got an initial game plan um as far as that goes and basically going to work on need to get the axle done and then we can worry about the tongue so um to get a length a good solid length on my h beam i do need to drive a bearing back in the hub real quick so that we can do some uh do some measuring and some maths This is awkward. Alright. And then we need to set the bearing in there. Oops. I mean, I gotta. I need the bearing, I need the spacer that the seal rides on and sets your... I need everything that's going to stack up on that side, so give me a minute. Okay, so... Bearing is back in. Sleeve is there, so what we got to do... And this 
box tube is laying here for a straight edge. So we got to measure from here to the bottom of the box tube, which is looking like about 10 inches. Nine and I can't, I can't get my head where it needs to be. Nine and three quarters. So there's nine and three quarters. And then to the center of the tire and to the bottom of the box tube is seven and a quarter. So to a hundred, we need a 120 inch wheel center to straddle four rows because four rows is 90 plus 15 on either side to get to the center of the row is 120. So basically it would be 120 to the center of the tire plus the what did I say seven and I said seven and a quarter roughly ish. this to a spot where I'm yeah we're calling that seven and a quarter and then nine and three quarters oopsie don't fall Yep, nine and three quarters. So we need to add the difference because the center of the rim is get, is offset to the outside. So we add the what is that? An inch and inch and a half? No, two and a half. Um, right? Because seven, eight, nine. Yeah, two and a half. Um, we add that to the length of the H beam, and then we're going to have to subtract the thickness of the end plates we're going to cap it with, which I think we're probably going to go with half inch, so subtract an inch. And that will give us the length of our tool or of our axle that we need to cut. All right, after doing the math and a little further discussion, um, so it would be 125 overall once you figure in the two and a half inches aside. And the way we're going to end up building the axle, the drop is going to be pretty darn short. Basically, the Unlike that spreader axle where the spindle's welded to right to the uh, axle, what we're going to do is actually make a sleeve that the spindle will slide into and pin it. That way, the spindle's replaceable. I mean, not that anything would ever happen to it, but you never know. Basically, to make the spindle serviceable, so if something bad happens, you can replace it. So, um, but that's going to be welded basically everything's going to line up right that that's going to be basically welded right to the bottom of the h beam so the only thing the end plate and the backing plate are doing is going to keep it from rocking back and forth so they don't it doesn't have to be overly stout so quarter inch plates can be plenty so anyway long story short 125 minus a quarter inch aside 124 and a half is what we got to cut the axle at so let me get this out of here i can go get toolbar unhooked up at the farm so that it's out of here and we got to get to 16 so i can grab that h beam because it's down where we can't get at it with the forklift and we'll get that cut and that'll pretty much be the end of the day because we'll be waiting on steel at that point
notice when I went to measure this, of course I measured it in the dark so I wouldn't have seen it anyhow, but uh, this isn't one piece beam. This is somebody butt welded two pieces together. That sucks. So I'll have to go, I got I think two more pieces at home. I'll have to go measure and uh, see. I think those are one piece. I think. I hope. It'd be nice if they were. Um, so I'm not gonna go there and come back because it'll be it'll be pushing dark by that point. So, um, I want to get things wrapped up here. I still got a mess to clean up from making parts this morning. So I guess I'm going to throw that thing back on the pile for now and see what I got at home. And first thing in the morning, I will uh, get that cut. Um, you're not going to miss much because tomorrow my, my main plan is going to be to work on getting the uh, fertilizer spreader tore apart. So we can start that fiasco, um, but basically all I got to do is cut it to size and um, I am going to have to miter the ends back a little bit to clear the rim because obviously the rim center is conical. So the higher up in the rim you get, the closer to center it gets. So I'll have to cut that back at an angle so we got plenty of clearance. We don't end up scraping the rim. Um, but that's, that's all you're going to miss is cutting this beam and then we'll be waiting on steel. Got to get, uh, my initial thought was to get burnouts made to reduce that machining. But dad said when, uh, he had the plates done for the hitch on the toolbar, they were starting to get backed up on their laser. So, um, probably just going to get some steel and make them ourselves. It's it's gonna be easy it's a few cuts and four holes and that's gonna be the extent of that so um we should once all the steel's here should be able to knock out an axle in an evening and there's not really a whole lot to it so machining actually the, the longest or hardest part of it's gonna be machining the new spindles because we're gonna have to turn threads on them with the mill or with the with the lathe um of course i gotta remember how to do that because last time i did that was when i was doing the cylinders on that 575 when i rebuilt it so four years ago was the last time i turned our single pointed threads on a lathe so it's gonna gotta remember how to do that again um but anyhow i guess you got the gist of it so that's it for this one we'll catch you guys on the next one there shouldn't be shouldn't be that much more to it maybe two more videos probably want to get in the frame done and want to put in the tank on and plumbing it up so should go pretty quick once everything's here